Good evening and welcome to this webinar. The seminar today with the topic of CFA role in global investment market is part of a bigger initiative under International Lecture Week. The International Lecture Week invites various research persons to share their global knowledge, their international insights and updates in many topics, including this current topic in finance, especially about CFA. The Faculty of Economics and Communication of the University really welcome this wonderful event. And uh, we do really hope that with this event, with this webinar, we can stay productive and insightful during this very tough pandemic era. Under the faculty, we have finance program, regular finance program, and also international finance program. For the regular program, we have uh, in the main campus of Alam Sutra, whereby for the international program, we also have the campus in Senayan. What unique about this finance program is that we offer double degree, especially uh, for the international program. We also work hand in hand with CFA Institute to prepare our students to get ready for the CFA certification in the future. And as far as I know, um, for the finance student, they also have a chance to um, have the examination for the CFA level one. And I think it's a very good initiative because this will equip the student with the knowledge and also good portfolio for them to face their future when they graduate. Last but not least, I do really hope that this webinar will inspire young minds and also other participants in this webinar to pursue their career in investment, banking, and finance area, including for the CFA designation. Enjoy the webinar. All the best and thank you. Over to you, Buyanti. Thank you, Pagatok, uh, for a short but I, 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 uh, particularly I think it's very insightful uh, opening remark. Um, now, I think we also now eager to uh, hear from our uh, three uh, speakers today. Uh, it's very rare that we have this uh, talk uh, with three speakers, but I think this is uh, also has been a um, uh, very unique situation. Uh, therefore, for the investment market or investment world, I think uh, this is also something to ponder and how to do with this one. So here I present actually the uh, Jakarta Composite Index from January to October. Uh, uh, yesterday, I think, and uh, here I, uh, I can uh, show here is when the pandemic is starts in March in Indonesia. So uh, we have the the lowest point of the uh, Jakarta Composite Composite Index in uh, approaching April, but now uh, it's increasing. Yeah, but it's not yet reaching the the, the January uh, Composite Index. And then we would like to know what the uh, speakers think about uh, this and then how is the prospect of the CFA uh, and the roles of the CFA uh, in terms of the uh, global uh, investment uh, management. So we have, as Pagata said, there are three speakers with us. Uh, first is uh, a Professor Piotr from uh, Kosminski University in Warsaw and he is also a member of the FA Society in Poland and also uh, uh, served in two committees of the CFA Institute. We also have here pa Rahmat Halim, uh, uh, part of the CFA Society Indonesia and he's the head of advocacy for the CFA Society Indonesia as well as the professional investors. Uh, and uh, last but not least, pa Bisma Dewa Brata, he was our lecturer in the Magister Management Applied Science uh, back, uh, I think, 10, about 10 years ago. 
Then Pak Bisma also member is also a member of the CFA Society Indonesia, and uh, he also now a director of the uh, one investor management uh, professional. Okay, without further ado, I think uh, uh, we will uh, agree that uh, the rundown of the, the the events would be 20 minutes sharing from each speaker. Then we will uh, follow up with the 45 minutes Q and A session at the end. Okay, uh, now I think the time uh, is for the first speaker. Uh, the time is yours, uh, uh, Professor Sherazan. Uh, I will stop my sharing. Then you can uh, share your uh, PowerPoint slide. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yantif. Uh, dear professors, uh, dear students, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to, to do this lecture from quite a distant place, but uh, due to nowadays world, it's possible to, to be with you even at such difficult times. Uh, I will try to say something about uh, the role of uh, CFA Institute in, uh, in current investment investment uh, process in current investment activity. Unfortunately, I need to disappoint you. Uh, neither CFA Institute nor CFA community doesn't have the power to uh, end the pandemia. We cannot do this, unfortunately. I would love, but uh, we can't. So uh, we are trying our best to do what we can, which is generally creating a standard for financial education that would be globally recognized and that would <clears throat> first be a sign of qualifications and knowledge. Second, it would promote certain activities, it would promote good standards, and it would enable uh, the information exchange, uh, experience exchange around the world. Chartered financial analyst. It's not only for analysts, but it's generally for people who want to have a knowledge in investment management, in uh, financial analytics, uh, in uh, evaluating the companies, evaluating financial instruments, and doing it in a unified manner and uh, having certain knowledge, certain experience, and having to follow certain standards. Uh, as you definitely know, CFA or uh, CFA charter is a designation pro for professionals that require both training and examination and certain professional experience. And also, which is quite important, requires to adhere to follow the code of uh, conduct and professional standard uh, to to be able to use the CFA the CFA profession. The institute itself has got uh, over 100,000 members, and unfortunately, I would like to I would like to say here that it's actually much more because the presentation is outdated and so on. I wouldn't say it's much more. I would say it's a bit more because uh, as uh, most of the institutions, uh, in, the institute had a problem with pandemia and the uh, June examination was postponed, so we didn't have the injection of, of additional, additional candidates. The whole, the whole standard, the whole, uh, the whole designation is thought as the connection of education, experience, and high ethical standards, and to be global, which is to very much extend true and I will tell you in a second how, how this worked for me. Apart from the CFA Charter and the CFA Examination, CFA Institute and CFA Societies, we also do other activities, which I believe are quite important in today's world. And uh, one of them is advocacy activities. Uh, now I can see that uh, the, the professor, the speaker who will speak uh, just after me is also a head of advocacy for CFA Society Indonesia. I'm a head of advocacy for CFA Society Poland, which is generally the activity that 
uh, addresses regulators and legislators, both national and international, uh, to promote, to advise, try to persuade them some good solutions on a legislatory basis. So we are generally advocating for rules, standards and laws that we believe are good. And actually, we are in a good position to do it because first, the Institute itself and the societies do a lot of reports and comparative studies, which is a great thing because CFA community with over 160 uh, various uh, um, societies in different countries in the world has got a unique advantage to be able to compare how certain things were, how they are regulated in different countries. Because we can simply mail or call people, let's say from CFA Society Indonesia, from CFA Society uh, UK, from CFA societies in, uh, in Americas or Africas, and we can ask them how this thing works uh, in, at your market how what are the problems what doesn't work and we can put it together and we can create a report that would contain the information basically no or close to no other reports uh, have because we are present globally and we are active globally uh, the co cooperation between societies is on many levels it's a cfa community with uh, all the societies having their emails, having their contact data, and closely cooperating. Of course, most of the time you cooperate close, the closest you cooperate is uh, the local societies uh, from neighboring countries. But often it's not only local, it's not only European Union in case of Poland, but also uh, other distant locations, which is, uh, which is also quite, uh, quite important and so which, which also gives you a different perspective. Including that CFA, it's partially on advocacy, partially on, on the society cooperation. There are uh, various committees created by CFA Institute to advise the Institute on global policies. Personally, I'm a member of two of them. One is Capital Markets Policy Council, which is about general uh, issues on uh, policies regarding to capital markets worldwide. The other is, is more EU focused, but it's also something the Institute is active. So it's not only about education and it's not only about certification. It's about trying to make things a bit better worldwide. Uh, within the Institute, more or less, because of course it changes, you have most of the members from America's, uh, uh, let's say, United States. You have EMEA, so Europe, Middle East and Africa with, uh, with a large number. And then you have Asia Pacific, although this is as of March 2019, so I'm, I'm practically sure that now Asia Pacific is bigger than EMEA because uh, it's actually the, the area of the biggest growth of member numbers is Asia Pacific, uh, where, uh, where the number of, of members is, uh, is mushrooming. What can we get? What a member, a student, somebody who applies to get the certification, uh, what does he or she get? First of all, it's about international designation and international recognition. Uh, with all the respect to all universities we are working at, we are studying it, there may be very good universities. But the problem is that as we go abroad, people often don't know what is Kozminski University, Warsaw, Poland. Maybe it's a good university, maybe not. What is the standard of their financial education? Who knows that? Practically abroad, not many. We are, of course, uh, affiliated with many organizations. We have certain standards, but still, it's not a one standard. It's a, basically the standard, the local standard for the university. In case of CFA designation, it is a global standard, which is the same for uh, the whole world. And personally, I have the CFA Institute said is gold standard. I'm not, uh, I don't know whether it's gold or not, but it's a good first standard, which is the same around the world. And personally, I have to say that a few years ago, as I became uh, the chief investment officer of one on pension funds in, uh, in Poland, 
uh, which was a subsidiary of, of American uh, company Invesco PLC, I went to their headquarters to, to Louisville in, uh, in Kentucky for some talks. And at that time I was 40, I was 30, sorry. So I was a bit younger than I am now. Uh, coming from a country that is distant and uh, not very big from US perspective. And I was sitting with, uh, with the bosses of, uh, of Invesco in Louisville. And I could, I could see the way they were talking to me was kind of somebody came from a strange place. We don't know what uh, he know, what he does know, what he doesn't know. Uh, they were trying to explain me some uh, very, very easy and, and things. And then they looked at my business card. It's not chief investment officer, board member, then I became a CEO. It's, it's not that part of business card that, that did the job. They looked at three letters behind my name. Oh, you are a CFA charter holder. We are sorry. And then we started to talk normally. Then they knew that I have even though I'm 40, 30, sorry, even though I'm coming from a place they may not precisely know where it's on the map, but they knew that I have this set of knowledge and experience certified by the letters of CFA. And it, that's basically the one single thing you can get from the CFA charter if, uh, if you want to get it. You have the opportunity to have a certificate that is global, both in terms of standards and in terms of recognition that would work for you, both with local environment and global environment. And I would say, of course, it's uh, the, the time where it helps you the most is the beginning of your career. Because if you are already in the business, you have your experience, you have your relations, then it's most of the time your experience works for you. But especially when you start your career, there's three letters behind your name may really help you. The charter holders, uh, what I can do with the char with CFA charter, I would say many things can be done, but uh, on average, most of the charter holders end up being uh, either portfolio manager or uh, research analysts. Some of them go into consulting, some of them go into risk management, or wealth management, but most of them get to, to the level of portfolio manager, even though the certificate itself and the, the body of knowledge is much wider than just uh, managing money, managing, uh, managing equities. Actually, many top employees employ CFA charter holders, but of course, it's not uh, it differs from one party, a part of the world to the other. What I can, uh, what I can see is that in uh, some jurisdictions, especially in, uh, in Asia, in Africa, uh, in Latin America, uh, people who know what CFA stands for, uh, they, have, they have a respect towards people who uh, have this designation. Uh, in the US, in Europe, it's maybe a bit more popular, so uh, it's not treated that way, but still it is the certificate that has got international recognition, that has got a uh, unified standard and gives you access to 170,000 fellow members uh, who you have the possibility to contact with through the CFA Institute platform. And 170,000 people in the investment industry worldwide is really a lot. The world becomes quite small with CFA, uh, with CFA charter, with CFA community. I thought that what can, um, can be of your interest is the compensation of CFA charter holders. Well, here, especially I speak to, uh, to the students who, who are listening to us. Uh, there is a study made cyclically. Uh, it's not every year, but, but uh, for most of the years, there's a study made uh, what are the salaries, the average salaries of CFA charter holders around the world and in different regions. So 
if you look at the worldwide compensation for all the roles for all the regions, the base salary goes up to 115,000 US dollars uh, per year on average. Maybe there are some jobs where you can uh, earn more, but I would say it's not the bad money in uh, today's world, including the bonuses, which have been cut recently a lot. Recently, I mean, I, uh, after the financial crisis, the thing goes up on average around $150,000 being earned all the roles, all the regions. I also did a slide where, uh, where I put the median salary at the students level, at the entry level in Asia Pacific. The amounts are of course lower, but I think to start with $42,000 per year, if that's your first job or second job, it may not be on average, of course, because it will differ from one fund from one company to the other. I think it's not a bad money. So that's also something uh, you, can, you can consider. And if you look at the last box, uh, from 1918 to 1919, this average salary of CFA charter holder entering the labor market in Asia Pacific rose by 9.4%. And it was not the best year on capital market. Probably now there will be no rise because we have a COVID time where generally uh, all the markets, not only financial markets have problems, but still if an average salary goes up by close to 10% in uh, a year, which is not the best year for uh, for the market, for the profession, I would say it's still, it's still something. So if I was to sum up the role of CFA charter in, uh, in global investment, I would say that it's from the market perspective, it's mainly the role of setting up a good global standard that is unified, that is the same anywhere in the world, and that is uh, held by close to 170,000 people, which also gives them access to the community, gives them the possibility to interact, the possibility to socialize, the possibility to exchange experiences, and the possibility to, to be within the CFA community, at the same time requiring from them to be ethical and to follow certain standards and certain rules. From the perspective of a potential CFA charter holder, I would say that the charter gives you among the probably hundreds of thousands of finance business alumni which uh, finish their university each year worldwide. I don't know, okay, I confess. I don't know exactly how many are their finance and business alumni uh, each year worldwide, but I believe it's somewhere more than 100,000 if we talk about the world as such. If among them, you are the one who also have a CFA charter holder, or you are on the way of getting a CFA charter, it gives the person, it gives you the possibility to stand out in terms of the knowledge. And it also gives you the ability to be noticed, to be seen in financial world. That's pretty much what I prepared for, for now. And thank you very much for your attention. And waiting for the questions uh, after the first presentation, of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Piotr. That's a very uh, interesting uh, figure that you see there, you, you showed there. Uh, so, CFA holder is highly appreciated globally in the investment world, and that career ex actually comes with the lucrative money. So, listen that, uh, students, that it's lucrative money. Uh, for the career, uh, that is from the point of view uh, globally. And now we would like to uh, listen from Pak Bisma, 
uh, who actually practicing the uh, who is, uh, has the he who is the CFA holder and also um, actively uh, investing not only in the local market but also in the uh, global market. And uh, can we have uh, Bisma now uh, for 20 minutes? Okay. Hi, everybody, uh, and thank you for the opportunity. Well, uh, I'm a kind of straightforward person. So uh, all of my experience as a practicing investment professional is just, uh, especially the one with CFA starter holder, can be summarized into uh, two words, competitive advantage especially in Indonesia. Uh, I have a unique background uh, that uh, half of my professional experience was in the US. So I spent 14 years in the US in investment management uh, as a consultant, as an investment analyst, and also uh, uh, associate in one of the big four companies. Okay. So when I come back in the US, uh, from the US for, for, for the first time in 2006, uh, I work for one of the big banks uh, in, the, in Jakarta. Uh, you can see it from my profile in LinkedIn. So because of my CFA credentials, I was uh, admitted straight into a VP vice president position in uh, credit risk management. And my job was to supervise the treasury department from credit, uh, credit perspective. So even though I don't have any background financials, I'm, I mean, banking background, but because I understand derivatives like option, futures, uh, the employer wants someone that understand the implication of that kind of instruments in, the, in Indonesia. So I may not be a banking professional for years, but because of the CFA uh, the, uh, credentials and some kind of, uh, um, well, they also saw my experience from the US. So I was, uh, I have a good advantage over other people for there. Even though some of my colleagues, uh, they have eight to 10 years experience in the banking industry. So you can really feel this, the, the skills that you have over your colleagues. But, and then for my second job in Indonesia was a, with a professional, with the investment management profit, uh, company. Now the challenge over there is that uh, most of the investment management company in Indonesia, they don't operate like in the US. They don't have any, uh, some kind of internal standard like that. So you have to create an pro investment process from scratch. Now, the CFA gives you advantage of, uh, give you framework to think about investment process from A to Z that things you cannot get it from any other programs. Let's say from uh, MM, Magister Management in Indonesia, from top of the uh, well-known university in Indonesia, the state-owned. I can tell that it is not well-structured like CFA program. So, if you see CFA program in level one, you, you are given the fund foundation about the tools. And then the second level you are given about valuation and the third level you are given uh, portfolio management skills. So if you see the curriculum up to that point, you will, you will understand that you have enormous advantage over other people in Indonesia. Another proof of that is that if you see one of the OJK, OJK rules for what we call uh, limited partnership, limited uh, participatory mutual fund, the requirement is that the fund manager or the head of that uh, program 
is either a CFA charter holder or someone with five years experience in the in the field. So if you don't have a uh, experience in the field, but you have a CFA charter holder, then you are immediately eligible for that position. And the position is usually head of investment or head of uh, investment programs like that. And then from my experience also, uh, CFA charter holders in Indonesia, still you have to be, have to remember that CFA program is designed in developed countries, especially in the US, where everything is well developed. Information is available everywhere, it's effective, and the level of financial literature, literature uh, is way above Indonesia. But here, Indonesia, Indonesia, we are still developing countries. As maybe if you remember that uh, the, the capital market in Indonesia started around 1990, mid of 1990s, 96, 98, like that. So it's not old enough compared to US market. So we are the government is still learning how to uh, achieve to become for example like regulation in singapore or, or in the us so you, it means you have to be flexible in applying what you learn from cfa program to indonesian environment you cannot just cut and paste everything from cfa program into what we have in indonesia you have to adjust it not, not the one I want to uh, water down everything what I, ha what I have learned, but uh, there are things that you can uh, cannot enforce from CFA program to Indonesian environment. You will, uh, you will meet obstacles that even though you hold to your idealism, you have to be able to adjust it to a certain level. There are red lines for certain things, but it doesn't mean that you just follow uh, the whole things in Indonesia. Okay. So uh, this is a good example uh, from what I've experienced in Indonesia. Uh, one of the state pension funds, uh, they uh, complain about a recommendation written by CFA charter holder in Indonesia, but uh, it turned out they lost a lot of money because of that. And then after they dig around about what's the reason is that the analyst who, uh, who was a CFA charter holder is that uh, they were forced by the investment banking side to write favorable recommendation about the uh, company. So in that case, from ethical point of view, it's a violation. But what are you gonna do about it? It's not something that uh, I don't take it lightly, but you have to realize that certain practice in Indonesia uh, is not up to the standard of uh, CFA center in internationally, especially in the US. Like that. So another example is that uh, I have a good a good one, but it's a good example. You have to when I have to create a product for an investment management company here, your CFA skills plays a major role. Uh, in creating investment process, portfolio management, procedures, everything. But then you find out that uh, the, fast, uh, the infrastructure of research is not well developed here in Indonesia. So how do you adjust a uh, standard that is that's so high in, uh, for Indonesian but can operate in local environment? So it means you have to find your own 
research resources and then you have to explain to OJK about the products and I cannot do that if it wasn't because of my CFA. That's one thing for sure. And also, uh, CFA is holder in Indonesia. Uh, maybe later, uh, Mr. Rahmat can explain that we only have less than 300, probably, CFA charter holder, compared to 250 million of Indonesian population. So it gives you a lot of advantage over the, the, the whole population. Compared to, let, let's say, Singapore, they have maybe four to 6,000 CFA charter holders for 5 million population. So you can see your advantage for your career if you uh, have a CFA charter holder in Indonesia. Even though you only completed level one or level two, you already have what skills more than other people. If you compare to other programs in Indonesia, local programs, and also for the requirement for uh, investment management representative or WMI in Indonesia, you can see that their, uh, uh, what they call, uh, their, their test, their examination are modeled after CFA examination, but in lower, lower standard. Because if you force, just like level one in uh, CFA internationally, uh, the exam, the exam uh, committee will weed out a lot of people from uh, from the participation. Uh, I saw the statistic for WMI. Uh, the passing rate is less than 25% of uh, and the, the WMI holders is around 3,000, if not mistaken. Can you imagine that 3,000 for the whole country? And then there's another certification locally in Indonesia. I won't mention the name, but you will know. <laughs> uh, it's, it consists of a shorter period of time, uh, but trying to capture the same fields as in a CFA. Less than 10 weeks of a program. Now you compare that with level one CFA, how many weeks that you have to spend studying. So I guess you can, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of straight for, straightforward person, okay? If I'm a share CFA charter holder and I saw this person, I mean this, uh, those programs trying to achieve, in a phrase of Americans, they, would, uh, they will call it, it's a joke, basically. <laughs> so also uh, become a safe shuttle in Indonesia, uh, comparing, if you compare with your, uh, the market, the advantage that they, uh, I have is that you are basically dedicated to your knowledge. CFA program will spend, uh, will require you to spend what thousand and thousand of hours studying. So it will tell you, it will tell the potential employers what kind of person you are. So if you spend, let's say, a thousand hour. Uh, thousand hours for one level, okay? In an environment in Indonesia where your, your office is in Sudiman area or in Taurin area, but, but your house is uh, BSD, Depok, or whatever it is, it's out suburb, it's far. You finish working from, uh, from the office at six, 
and then try to get home. What? Two hours? Three hours? You arrive at home at nine, and then you have to study for another two or three hours before the night. So it can, it kind of tells the person what kind of person you are. That's not easy in Indonesian environment. Uh, I'm blessed that when I took my CFA, uh, I was still in the US where there is no traffic jam, everything is in order. So you can st uh, start focus on studying. And at the time I have a, a family that encouraged me or understand what I, what I took for the professional career. So it's very uh, a good environment, but <clears throat> Indonesia, it's a, it's a different story. <clears throat> you have commitment to your family, to your friends, and then to your job. And uh, what uh, traffic jam, everything that is not supportive about your study. So if you can achieve CFA, they will know the potential empire that, oh, this is a very dedicated person that the uh, person that willing to sacrifice everything for their career. So you have kind of uh, uh, one of 1000 kind of person. That's what I experienced in, in Indonesia. Uh, also, if you study, uh, read a lot of OJK rules, rules, they are almost copy and paste of CFA society. Uh, code of ethics and standard of personal conducts, but they make it into rules. Basically, if you violate violate the rules, you will be reprimanded by OJK or can be kicked out of industry by OJK. But if you already have shareholders, you under you understand that rules is ethical standards. What's the difference between ethical standards and OJK rules? In ethics, basically, if you violate ethics, it's kind of gray area. It doesn't mean you violate the regulation. But when you violate OJK rules, you violate the regulation. So for me, unless the, uh, having a CFA shuttle holders, when you when I read about the regulations, it's not something that will burden me because I have practiced that every day on of my life. So it's kind of like uh, Indonesia, OJK has to put that as a regulation and force it, not ethical rules. Ethical rules, if nobody saw it, then you can just you know get away with it. But in Indonesia, because of the environment, it has to be put as a regulation. So you can see the different environment, uh, see if it's all in Indonesia versus in the US, uh, the difference between them. So basically, uh, if you have uh, CFC holders, uh, you are in a different level of different level game of uh, your career. Uh, so I guess that's the whole point of my uh, sharing that uh, just towards competitive advantage. Thank you. So, uh... Thank you, Pabisma. Sorry, I'm taking over a bit uh, from Buyanti because Buyanti just come back. Uh, some internet uh, connection issues with Buyanti internet. And then thank you for sharing, Pabisma. There is a lot of things that we can uh, hear from your sharing that your experience after granting the CFA degree, it opens a lot of opportunity, as you said, the competitive advantage for yourself and then for your career. But also, despite all the opportunities, of course, CFA requires hours of st studying hours, as you mentioned before, but then tell your pers uh, prospective employers what kind of person you are. 
okay and also from your sharing we can see that how different the investment situation uh, between the american context and indonesian context yeah thank you very much uh, for the sharing pabisma and then uh, for the next uh, speaker uh, we would like to welcome uh, mr rahmat halim uh, to share about the trend of CFA holders in Indonesia, career progression, CFA exams, and activities of this society in Indonesia. And then uh, the floor is uh, for you, pa, uh, Rahmat Halim. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Rahmat Sugiono Halim. I am the head of advocacy of CFA Society Indonesia. Uh, I will inform you more about CFA charter holder in Indonesia. As Professor Pio already mentioned, this is a more update. is as of 31st March this year. We have 17,000 plus, seven, 170,000 charter holder and about 300,000 candidates. We will go to the Indonesia uh, numbers later on the next slide. So we have also about 600 plus affiliated university and about 60 regulators recognize our program. These are the benefits as mentioned by the professor before, so I will not go over through them again. Uh, this also the, the professor has also mentioned. So Basically, in Indonesia, we have about 249 members. That's how the profession is unified. We, we may even share the same slides. Sorry. Piotr speaking. Okay. Uh, this the core is that these are the members who work in the investment industry, while non-core are those that work in other industry. As you can see, we like to have more female members as the numbers is way out of line. This is CFA Indonesia demographics. Mostly we see a large number in the charter holder 26 to 30 years old because of the four years experience requirement, which have been reduced to minimal of three years or 4,000 hours. The number of years they have been with the Indonesian society, a great number in a year, then sometime they uh, this do not join anymore. Then this is the cumulative nine year or above. We have very loyal member here. This is the jobs that CFA charter holder in Indonesia do. We have research analyst, portfolio manager, CFO, CEO, CIO, these are the employers that employ them. As you know that our president director is the CEO of Bank Tabungan Negara, BTN, Mr. Pahala Mansuri. Our vice president is at Pricewaterhouse. And also we have also from uh, one of the director is in AXA Mandiri. This is the primary investment focus of C CFA charter holder in Indonesia, mainly in equities. Some are in fixed income. This not, not applicable is that they work in non-investment industry like in telecom, uh, their own company and such. But employer support, uh, we do have employers who will reimburse if they pass the candidate pass the exam and some of them even the membership fee then this is the trend of the candidates as you can see from 2013 to now it's have been growing maybe the 2020 numbers is slight decline because of the pandemic uh, again the gender we have a good encouragement of the female candidates they are joining us more. 
Then benefit of the charter holder is again a well recognized certification brand. And this I experienced myself that you will definitely get invited for the job interview stage. Whether you get the job or not, depend on your experience and your self promotion. The main thing is for the charter is for networking and opening doors. We have charter holders in about more than 100 plus companies in Indonesia. And also what you learn in CFA will help you greatly in passing the local licenses. The only thing you need to, to familiarize yourself is with the local, local regulation, the OJK rules. Then this is what Pak Bisma has mentioned is for the Reksadana Pernyataan Terbatas or Limited Participation Mutual Fund. You can get a waiver instead of five years experience in investment. As long as you have a charter holder, you can uh, become the lead. You can do the projects. Sorry. Then, of course, we have conference, webinar. We have global passport program that uh, allow you to go and attend webinar in other countries, CFA of other countries at their local cost. Then for CFA Indonesia program itself, we have annual research challenge, which BINUS also participate. This year, we will be launching the kit off on Tuesday, next Tuesday. Then we have semi-annual mock exam to help candidates to get a feeling on how they will do in the exam. We also have a mentorship program whereby we match uh, experienced charter holder with uh, CFA candidates so that the CFA candidates can learn what they need for their jobs and how to advance their career. We also have a monthly professional development and webinar. Uh, the next one will be in on Tuesday, or oh, sorry, on Monday, next Monday. We have quarterly networking event whereby all the charter holders come together, share a meal, like buka puasa, end of the year forecast dinner. Then we also have annual investment conference. The last time we did it is uh, one year ago. It's on AI and big data. And also we also broadcast employment opportunities to our members. Uh, this is the exam, level one, two, and three. Level one, you learn more on the investment tools, the green slide. Level two, also you learn on the green slide too, as well as the asset classes. Level three is more on portfolio management. Then the, with the pandemic, we make a switch from paper-based to computer-based exam, starting from uh, 2021. It's still, uh, the hours is shorter, but it's still 1.5 minutes per question. The next exam will be in February. You, If you fail in February, you can reset it again in August. There uh, must be a six month lapse between exam uh, sitting. And this is my favorite subject. Uh, I encourage everyone to apply for the access scholarship because the, 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 the recipe for applicants, we get one scholarship. This year, last year, we get about 16 scholarship. Then this is the university scholarship. You can ask the business uh, consultant. Uh, they receive at least three scholarship per university. Then this is what we are working currently. It's a regulator scholarship. If any of you know someone who work in IDX, Bank Indonesia, OJK, XCDX, you want to give them scholarship. About 20 annual scholarship per year per institution. There's also the ladies scholarship, uh, media scholarship. You can find out more at this www.cfa.org scholarship.
Uh, that's it for my, uh, I just want to show you one more slide. So let's enroll at CFA Institute. Since our topic is on career, what you can do with your CFA charter. Uh, I already given this to the Panitia. Uh, maybe you can ask them a copy. This is uh, give a few description what you can do with your CFA charter holder. As you can see, we have academia, equity research, regulatory authorities, corporate bank, fintech, hedge fund, corporate finance. Okay, that's it. My presentation. We can move on to the Q and A then. Thank you. Buyanti, I think uh, you're still mute, Buyanti. <laughs> okay, let me do it. Okay, thank you, Bo. Yeah, that's that's okay now. Okay, right. Okay, can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Okay. Thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry. Somehow uh, there's something happened in my laptop, so I had I was kicked out. Yes. Uh, just uh, ten minutes ago. So um, it is interesting to uh, see that uh, three speakers actually telling that the CFA holders are. Uh, much appreciated in the working environment and much uh, acknowledged uh, compared to other professions, uh, not only in the investment um, management uh, uh, career, but also in banking like uh, business experience. Um, however, there are some, uh, the aim of the CFA is uh, all over the world is actually to have the uh, standard for how is the conduct and the skills for the financial analyst uh, all over the world. However, Pak Bisma also uh, uh, make it um, uh, highlight, make a highlight that there, there is still a distinction of the working environments of CFA holders in the developed uh, markets and in the emerging markets. Um, no pain, no gain. That uh, suppose uh, Pak Rahmat would like to say because uh, we see Pak Rahmat's uh, presentation showing that in order to get what is the lucrative salary that uh, Professor Piotr said that um, you should have these uh, three levels of uh, CFA exams, yeah, which is not easy. I think what is the pass rate, Pak, of for level one? It's well, only, level one is about 34%. Only 34%. Depend uh -huh. on the year and your cohorts. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, so uh, getting to the higher level is uh, the, the pass rate also getting lower. Yeah. yeah and so, also, exactly. uh, sorry, the bad news is that for Indonesian candidates, the passing rate is 2 to 5% lower than the global average. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Yeah, so CFA holders in Indonesia. Uh, I think you you have to uh, work harder, yeah. If you want to uh, get the the the, hold, the designations uh, professional um, uh, career in the investment, okay. But I'm uh, if you want to ask questions, uh, uh, there's William Chandra, and then also uh, okay, William Chandra, if you could uh, ask your questions. Pak pa Arif, can you uh, unmute William Chandra? Can you raise 
your hand, William. There's a William Hello. would like to ask questions. Okay, William. Okay. Uyanti, yes. uh, I want to ask a question for uh, Pak Rahmat Halim. Pak Rahmat, okay. Yes. Pak Rahmat Halim, uh, good afternoon and thank you so much for your for your insight today and I learned a lot from you today, thank you so much. But I want to ask something about uh, mockism because you have mentioned before um, the mockism for level one, right? In your slideshow. Yes. Yeah, to be honest, I am a level one candidate for uh, 2020. Okay. And I want to ask how can I join the mockism you have mentioned before? And I want to ask about your tips for us who want to do an exam at December, like that. OK, uh, thank you. OK. For the mock exam, I think starting tomorrow, the CFA Society Indonesia will be email blast to all the level one registered candidates to participate in Kaplan uh, mock exam. I think it's online ex mock exam. I think they also will time you for the three hours and six hours exam morning and afternoon session. So just wait for the email. If you have you know not, do not receive it, then maybe you can contact us to Bu Anastasia at CFA Society Indonesia. You can Google the uh, website. Then regarding on uh, what is the uh, steps to pass the exam is practice, practice, practice by practicing is that you're doing uh, time yourself doing the exam you get a lot of uh, uh, mock exam you, the cfa institute also have their own mock exam you can i think you can access them just make sure you time that each question you need to answer is one minute one and a half minutes and you try to for your mock exam try to score at least 70 percent or above can I add something? Yes, please. Yeah, sure. uh, Piotr. If I if I can add up to uh, to what uh, Rahmat Kalim has said, I would advise personally. I would advise, uh, of course, to study and to practice, but to to have a plan for the study. Because there's a lot of material, you will not do it like uh, like at the university where you focus on one thing which more or less you are able to study and memorize and then go to the exam. So here it takes more time. And also I would strongly advise you to go for mock exams and to do the tests at house. So it's very different from just studying from a book. <laughs> Doing the test is very different. So I used to even uh, try to create a similar environment so I was like, if the exam is uh, three hours break and three hours of, of, uh, of doing the test, I was doing similar things at home studying. So mm -hmm. I was sitting for the same time mm -hmm. doing the questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a break and then mm -hmm. another session. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, that's the key thing, being systematic mm -hmm. and getting used to the form of exam of the testing. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ramat and Mr. Peter. But uh, can I ha have a uh, two another question, Bu Yanti? Uh, one more, yeah, William, because Jason is waiting. One more okay. question will do. Okay. Uh, I want to ask: Is it normal to candidates if feel like uh, when we learn all about the materials and we sometimes like uh, what I have learned? So sometimes like a panic attack is attacking me when I'm learn all materials, it is normal for our candidates to do that. And sorry, Ms. Uh, Buyanti, I want to ask about the technicals, some, something technical is about my passport. Because my passport uh, only valid for a six month later for experience. So can I still use that passport for my test or not? Or for my exam or not? That is my last question, thank you. I think Pak Rahmat can answer this one. I think for that passport, maybe you can ask the CFA Institute, just send them an email. The advice is that uh, your passport need to be valid six months on the day of the exam. 
So since you, if you are saying that your six month is starting here, that means December, come December, you have only four months left. Uh, rather be safe if you can contact CFA Institute as they are the exam body and ask that question yourself. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, William, uh, yeah, I think uh, practice with the same situations when uh, you are going to take an exam, like uh, Professor Pilter said, that is very beneficial, I think. Okay, the next. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Jason of uh, Fiorenzo. Can uh, Pa Arif, uh, can you raise your Hello? hand? Okay. okay. Is my right. voice good? Okay, so my question is, how will a Venetian could register for the CFA test? And how long will the studies of C... Like, what is the length of studying in CFA? Like, how long will it enter it and like, how many years? Thank you. Again, okay. for Pak Rahmat, I think. <laughs> uh, you, you can assess to apply for the exam, you can access the CFA Institute website. In my slides, they have www.cfainstitute.org. Um, the, the other question, sorry, what's the other question? How long is the CFA um, uh, uh, study? Well, That's okay. What, mm -hmm. uh, the process uh, for this. Uh, for this year, is you, the fastest you can complete the CFA program is two and a half years. That means if you take this is the exam and you take the level two in uh, 2020, you can do it in two and a half years. But since we moved to computer-based testing, you can do it in two years. Mm. But then, of course, for charter holder, you need at least three years working experience, minimal of three years or 4,000 hours. So to get the charter holder, you need at least three years to complete it. Is that answering your question, Jason? Okay. Right, there is a question here from, I think from Nico. Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, I have a questions that might be the three of speakers can uh, answer this question. Is the CFA exam questions are Americentric? I don't know what does it mean, Americentric. Uh, Nico, if you can- I think it. I know. Oh yeah, okay. Now, uh, so you can answer it first, uh, Piotr, and then Pak Rahmat and Pak Bisma can answer it Okay. I would say they are less and less Americentric. As far as I understand, your, your um, logic, Americentric, is centralized on the US uh, market, US regulation, and US, uh, let's say, accounting standards, the, the US gap. It used to be quite concentrated in terms of especially US gap, so generally, generally accepted accounting principles, and uh, alternative investments where a lot of time and a lot of questions were devoted to asset-backed securities and uh, things that are uh, quite typical for US market and may not be typical for other markets. But nowadays, I would say it's more or less focused internationally than uh, only just uh, at the US. But definitely, to some extent, it is US focused and something that was probably most difficult for me is that the understanding of ethics is very Americentrized, as you said, because uh, I think in Indonesia, similarly to Europe, you are a statutory law country, not a common law country. US, uh, Great Britain, uh, Ireland, few other countries are common law countries. And uh, there's a difference of understanding of law, but also rules and regulations. So if you look at the code of, code of ethics and professional uh, code of uh, conduct and standards of professional practice, you would see they are very short, but their interpretation and the cases 
it's a lot of material and you need to transfer your way of thinking to switch into a bit like common law and this is something that really comes from the us and basically stays there and we need to to learn it i don't know if i uh, answered your question yes i think the professor uh, answered it very well i have nothing more to add except that maybe because the us in the past has been the center of the financial innovation so that's why uh, if you take out the US, I don't think the CFA uh, people will look up on the CFA too, uh, because currently in Asia, we have a lot of candidates, but not that many charter holder yet. Mm. Uh, that's one the reason, mm. because we see the US as the center of the financial innovation. Mm. Okay. But it's not a metric. You can learn from <laughs> about IRF, uh, beside the gap also. Mm. So you learn what is there is in the world, right? Right now, what is popular, Bitcoin, AI, big data, it's all covered in the syllabus. Oh. Okay, good. So for uh, the financial innovations, yeah, uh, the, the curriculum or the syllabus actually is uh, always updated with the financial uh, technology that uh, I think now the trend is quite uh, uh, moving very fast, very fast. Yeah. But Bisma, do you want to have a say about the Americentric? Uh, yes, uh, maybe not from gap point of perspective or, or ethically uh, ethics for perspective uh, for anti perspective if you learn about uh, i forgot uh, investment advisor act of 1933 in the us or 34 uh, about fiduciary du duty yes the ethical standard was modeled after that but now uh, for the other side for in terms of uh, uh, practical uh practical point of view here's a good example everybody in, uh is everybody familiar with cap m capital asset pricing model basically you try to uh, come up with discount rate to value a company or a bond or everything one of the component uh, is what we call risk-free risk-free rate and is defined by uh, defined as uh, interest rate that, uh, that will not default because it is uh, quote unquote guaranteed by the government. So in the US, what is guaranteed was a US Treasury, and that's uh, the benchmark for uh, risk free rate. Okay, now uh, then the, the rest of interest rates. Uh, for banking, for bond, basically treasury rate plus certain spread, okay, two percent, three percent, based on their own risk uh, uh, risk perspective. But in Indonesia, a lot of people using what uh, what we call BI rate, Bank Bank of Indonesia rate. What is it? Uh, how much is that now? Uh, five percent. I forgot if anybody knows. Four. Four percent. It's a benchmark for uh, risk-free rate in Indonesia. Now, if you really understand the definition of risk-free rate, I ask you, what is uh, the rate for sukuk or re soon? It's much higher than four percent, right? So if we are practicing that in Indonesia, which one will you use? The BE rate, which is 4%, or the ORI rate, basically is this also guaranteed by government, 12%. In real life, why would I, what would I invest in BE rate? There is no instrument for BE rate. I will, invest in ORI, SUKU, or let's say banking deposit, 4%, 5%, 
which is guaranteed by the government. See, you see the difference between practical and uh, theoretical side. Yeah. From in developed countries, yes, uh, the the risk free rate uh, refers to government securities, but in Indonesia, there are government what we call maybe semi quasi government rate or government protected in disguise. Mm. <laughs> this basically is risk free rate. Mm. See, that's something that you have to think of about application and uh, theoretical point of view. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, all speakers, because uh, so it is very clear. Uh, in the CFA, uh, during your orientations or during your uh, preparations for the exams, of course, you will have a standard materials because this is also uh, 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 designations, uh, professions that will be acknowledged uh, globally. Yeah, so there is a standard. But however, as you got the, the or hold the, the profession designations, then when you would like to uh, apply your uh, knowledge, you still have to um, think also locally, okay? So you have the knowledge in global standard, but you have also to think uh, locally, yeah? What is the, the like Bisma said, what, what measure that you use for the risk free rate, for example, yeah? Now there's a question uh, uh, for uh, Professor Piotr. So this is for you, Piotr. How applicable is the knowledge studied in CFA for the future and how far is the horizon for that future? Uh, thank you. Uh, the answer for the first question is probably easier than the second one. I would say that yes, it is applicable for the future, uh, partially because the the rules and the standards of uh, finance and financial management, they do not change that much. They get improved. Some models are being replaced by newer ones, but still uh, the general approach to money management is similar as it, as it was. Uh, the valuation works on similar basis than it used to decades ago. Uh, the thing that changes is things are getting more and more complicated, more and more technical. And of course, the science goes forward. So there are new methods, new models, which may be actually better than the old ones. And I would say CFA Institute is following them with the cur curriculum of knowledge. So I would say this is a good thing for the future and it follows the forecast for the future. But of course, a CFA exam is not exam on advanced uh, quant modeling or uh, uh, fintech. It has got aspects of fintech, but of course it's rather the CFA Institute or the CFA exam following things that are being invented than the other way around. So I would say yes, for the future, it's, it is a good thing, but of course uh, the science is faster than the CFA Institute with examining it. So if somebody has been discovered or invented quite recently, uh, there will be some time after you will see it in, uh, in the curriculum of exam. Uh, the second question, how far is the future? Uh, honestly speaking, I don't know. I believe the future is everything from now until the end of the world, which uh, may or may not be a, a distant future. I think the CFA Institute, they try their, their best to actually adjust to what they think the future will be. But of course, with adjusting to the future, you need also to kind of stay within the core to, to, to keep up with, uh, with the market. Because if you, if you stand out too much, then you may actually lose the qualification that are required now on the market. Because one thing is what is discovered or what is uh, done now uh, by the scientists. And the other thing is whether and when it will be implemented into practical, practical finance. 
if I may add something. Uh, yes, Pak. If you are already a charter holder and you are also a CFA Institute member or CFA Society member, they will give you a refresher package every year that you mm. can keep mm. yourself up to date. Mm. And also you can also join the professional mm. learning webinar they give every almost every two weeks or so. Mm. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Peter and Pak Rahmat. Okay, I think it, it answer your question, yeah. Now there's a question from Christelle Emmanuel. Um, she knows that there is a difference between CFA and ACCA. However, in the in, uh, investment industry, which one is more, um, what to say, it, which one is uh, better? I may take this question if uh, if I can. Uh, it depends what you would like to do. Mm. As you know, CFA stands for Chartered Financial Analyst. ACCA sta stands for Association Association of <clears throat> Accounting of Chartered uh, Certified Accountants. Accounting. So, if you want to become a financial analyst, money manager, risk manager. Uh, for risk manager, actually, you have better certificates for the risk management itself. But if you want to go into finance and investment, so you are either analyze or you are either managing money or analyzing things for people who manage money, uh, or you are somehow into controlling, uh, but uh, from the investor's point of view, I would advise you to do the CFA because that's what CFA is about. On the other hand, if you would like to become an auditor, uh, either external or internal, uh, accountant, because it is about accountant, mm. uh, if you want to, to work for a big four in, in uh, audit uh, departments, probably ACCA would work better because that's what ACCA is about. And of course, if you want or you don't know what to do or uh, you have a lot of time or you are very ambitious, you can actually do both. <laughs> okay, uh, is that clear, uh, Christel? Okay, yeah, Christel. Okay, uh, now I would like to ask questions to the three of you. It's uh, uh, more in general about the investment. It's not uh, only about the CFA, but I know that uh, both Piotr and Pak Rahmat actually. Uh, saying about the first level is about the ethical ethic professions okay but uh, i would like to know because i read this uh, some papers that the ethical mutual funds perform better than the the non-ethical one well if we say that non-ethical but i will say the conventional one so what do you think about it well, if I the think, investment is all about money and profits? Well, I think I'm, I'm going to say something controversial because I'm, I'm quite, of a, like quite, quite skeptical about um, these so-called ethical funds. And uh, today I even had a lecture uh, about uh, social, uh, social investing, impact investing. And... I said at the beginning that uh, after this um, after this lecture, you probably will not know more than before. You may actually know less because I wanted to show some doubts and some controversies connected with that. So I would say that generally uh, the best results are the results of good money management. And the funds can be ethical, can be, well, unethical, whatever. But if they are properly managed over a long time, the results should be decent. Of course, if you are managing your money not under the standards of, of market, but you are managing the money uh, without any standards, like organized crime does, the, the rates of return there can be exceptionally high. But of course, it's not something I, I believe and I hope any one of us would like to do. But if we are into a regular investment universe and uh, we are seeing all these uh, surveys showing that ethical funds perform better, ethical companies perform better, 
uh, I would advise you to focus on how this research is done. Because very often the data is chosen that way that it actually has to prove the, the thesis. Uh, two examples. Uh, somebody said that ecologically oriented companies perform better than those who, who are hard for the environment. But when was it? It was before the commodity rally in years 2004, 2007. Before that, it was said, the old economy is old fashioned, no returns, doesn't make any sense. But suddenly, the surge came in, suddenly the commodities were on the rise in 2005, 2006, 2007. And that voices have stopped because the reality wasn't supporting it. Then I could see uh, reports saying that, uh, that uh, strategies that do not engage in depth, uh, including uh, Sharia driven funds, are better. When, when was it? It was 2008, 2009, after the world financial crisis. And if you were not investing in debt related products, you were not hit by the crisis. But before and after that, it's not that obvious that things go this way. And I would say that uh, we have to be very careful if we really want to stay on facts and not just repeat somebody's uh, saying, if we are saying that uh, funds that do this or that policy perform better, because we need to go into, we, we need to go deeper. And sometimes we can be surprised what our, what our uh, results uh, will be. It's exactly the same when we, uh, when we look at the company results and try to connect them with uh, ESG, with diversity, with things like that. You, have, you can find thousands of various uh, works, various articles and books trying to prove that the more ESG you are, the better are the results and so on. But then if, if that only comes from analyzing a simple correlation between uh, having certain ESG policies implemented and the results of the company, I think you are on the wrong side because there are much more other factors that can affect it. And also uh, it goes two, two ways. So the companies which have poor results, the companies which do not grow, uh, they either stagnate or they are sometimes even, uh, they even go bankrupt. They don't adopt any policy. They don't show it up because they have simply no time and resources to do that. The companies which develop, the companies will, that will become global, they kind of greenwash or ESG wash themselves to be more popular, to be better viewed by the investors who use that ESG principles, and they spend a lot of money on it. If you, for example, look at uh, Apple company, that company was seen as average in terms of ESG, then it spent a lot of money to be seen as one of the top, and then finally, somebody realized that, ah, this is the company that produces mobile phones in China where uh, the working labor conditions are not very perfect. And they are using the uh, rare earth resources from Africa where the labor conditions are uh, similar to, uh, well, concentration camps. And, and they are still very good. And then the rating come down. So I would be really, uh, I would be really kind of away with simple correlations and uh, and uh, assuming that things are things are as uh, some people want them to to be. Thank you. Sorry for a longish speech. Oh no no no, that's a, a one a, a point of view that I think uh, perhaps others do not have. Okay, if I could ask you, Pak Rahmat, will you, when you do um, the analysis for the company, will you consider their ESG, although it is, there's no rating for that, 
for such company, for example. But will you consider the corporate governance, their environments, and sustainability? Yes, I will consider that, especially the corporate governance. But I think in Indonesia, we are still lacking the product. In, in fact, for Saria product itself, we are still lacking. Uh, we, I don't think we have enough uh, the manpower or resources to do a good job in ESG or ethical funds, all that. We are still lacking investment professional who can understand that. And also the data for ESG also, the company also does not publish it very well. Thank you. Okay. Let's say, Pak Bisma, let's say if we have that data, are you with Pak Rahmat or are you with Piotr? <laughs> I'm with uh, Mr. Piotr. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have to agree with him. <laughs> uh, basically, yeah. if you learn a lot about investment, there is no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. One strategy yeah. can perform well. Uh, because of the environment fits that strategy or the timing is uh, matches the, uh, well for the strategy. So basically for the last 10 couple of years, passive investment is the, you know, it's like everything. Passive investment beat everything. But before, you see the, the other way around <laughs> like that. Uh, remember the Tiger Cup, uh, I forgot. Uh, uh, before the bus of 2000, 2000 the internet bus, uh, one of the tiger, uh, I, I forgot the name, but one of the, the tiger cup, basically, uh, he didn't invest in internet company. So all of the investors pull out his uh, their money out, so he went bankrupt. Okay. A couple of uh, two years after that, all the investors that invest in invested in internet company, they, they lost a lot of money. Mm. But that person already out of the business. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you explain that? Mm. This is a good example. Another good example for local Indonesians, company, Indonesian companies. What we call the 50 rupiah companies, 50, mm. basically what, five cents, mm. five cent company. Mm. Basically, what we call uh, sleeping stocks for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. If you do valuation on that companies, I'm sure it worth a lot more than fifty cents. <laughs> but how do you explain that the stocks never go up and down? It's basically just a flat line for years and years mm -hmm. because of the liquidity. And in Indonesia, that's because of, of uh, the influence of market makers, the dealers, the brokers. If the dealers and the brokers, they don't play, mm -hmm. they don't, you know, force the stocks to be out in the market, the value of the company will stay the same, regardless of the how well-performed the management is. In, in, in the US or in the Europe, it's the liquidity, the depth of the market is well-founded, but here in Asia, a certain player can influence the whole, I mean, the whole companies, the valuable companies. Mm. Those kind of things is not teach, it's not taught in CFA program. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is I just I'm just curious. Is it because uh, in Indonesia um, the minority uh, shareholders uh, act or law is not protected enough compared to the developed countries? I have to admit, yes. The reason mm. scandals, the Jiwasraya, mm. it shows it's basically all hell breaks loose. <laughs> so it shows that uh, the rotten, rotten practices uh, have been conducted for years and years. When I came for the, first, for the first time in Indonesia, uh, I also try to try to prospect Jiwasraya. And I know that kind of practices is, has been done way before 2008. 
So now it's just the accumulation, and finally it it blows up. And uh, if let me mention all the scandals, the Century Bank scandals. Did the investors get the money back? No. Then Sarijaya Securitas scandal. Did the money investor get back the money? No. What else? You can list a lot of investors as I mean scandal in Indonesia, and none of the money has returned to the investors. How do you explain that? Yeah. Life. Life. Yeah, that's <laughs> life. <laughs> okay. I don't know the, full I don't of know. certain uncertainty. I don't know the Indonesian uh, standards and practice of Indonesian market, but I have to say that uh, basically scandals and frauds, they happen everywhere. Mm. And I once had a presentation on, on uh, corporate governance or rather corporate misgovernance <laughs> uh, of companies in different countries. And from my observation, from my perspective, it's not that... Uh, you have this hierarchy where you have the most developed countries, let's say the US, where the standards are higher and everybody is getting uh, his or her money. And then you have the, the middle countries and then you have the developing countries and then you have uh, some sub-Saharan African countries where everything works, works badly. From my experience, it really depends. And I was honestly speaking, I was really surprised, if not shocked, being uh, into a conference, a small cup conference in New York City in the US and meeting people who are offering me things. I was presenting my company there, but there is so-called toxic financing. And the people were offering me things, offering me some strange loans, strange structures. Mm. And then I could hear my friends who were talking how the thing really looks like. And I would say that such people would be never allowed, never would, would be invited for a co small cup conference in a place like Poland. And in the US, they were there. And for some of them, I would think that in Europe, at least in my place, there would be a prosecutor or uh, a financial supervision, KNF, uh, looking after them. And they were still walking freely in New York City at, uh, at the conference. And I remember uh, that uh, one of Polish company was uh, taking over a German company. Usually it's the other way around, but this one, it was that way. And the German company was listed on a DAX stock exchange in, in Frankfurt. And it, has, it hadn't published any report for more than 18 months. And I was in a shock because if it happened in Poland, after two days, the trading, after one day practically, the trading is suspended. After a week or a, a month maximum, the Securities and Exchange Committee of the Republic of Poland steps in and starts the proceeding. After a few months, it would be probably delisted and there will be a prosecutor running after the management of that company. Well, in Poland, Poland at that time, it two years. <laughs> two years, okay. So Poland at that time, it was more than ten years ago. So we were considered a developing, uh, an emerging market. Now we are a bit more into a developed market, but still, I was in a shock because I thought that in Germany, this well-developed market, everything should be so right, everything should be so good, everything should be so ethical. No, it isn't. At least not always. And I think that you have honest and dishonest people everywhere. And uh, of course, there is a difference between effective uh, prevention of, of fraud and law enforcement in different jurisdictions, but it's not that obvious. And unfortunately, what the regulators often do not understand is that the most difficult case for them is, as you said, to make the investors get their money back and to be able to catch somebody who was doing a fraud on purpose. 
because it's relatively easy if you have this regulation or over regulation you have a regulator imposing fines and you have a prosecutor or police doing his job it's relatively easy to catch somebody who was running a business then something went wrong then that person started doing things uh, in an improper way and then at the last moment decided to steal the money it's relatively easy to catch such person but if there is a fraud from the beginning there's a group of mobsters saying we are going to do the fraud we will drain the investors out of the money and they are building the whole structure just for the purpose of that fraud it's very difficult to catch such people and i can i can think of uh, a company called satyam computers it was uh, it was quite a big case, Indian company listed in, uh, in NASDAQ uh, some years ago. They were basically falsifying the books, but they were not, it was not creative accounting. So something is there, but we are accounting it differently. No, they were simply writing their numbers from their heads. So how much revenue uh, shall we have this month? Okay, 100,000. Okay, so let's write 100,000. Okay, what were the costs? Huh? What the cost could be last month, it was 80,000. So this month, maybe 81,000. Okay, let's write 81,000. And the company was operating. The company was listed on NASDAQ. And nobody was aware it's happening until the moment where their CFO, chief financial officer, broke down and confessed that they were doing this. What would happen if he didn't confess? Maybe they would exist until today, being listed in the US at the most mature market in the world, a uh, market seen to be very uh, regulated and effective and corporate governance friendly and so on and so on. I don't know what would happen, but my impression is that if there is a fraud from the very beginning, a fraud that is prepared by some mobsters and not by somebody who finally decided to steal the money of the company because the business went wrong. It's very difficult to catch that person. And it's really rare uh, when the investors get their money back, uh, whether it's US or Europe or uh, emerging markets. It's a difficult thing, I have to say. OK, thank you for uh, uh, interesting and insightful um, examples and experience. OK, I think we are approaching to the uh, end of our session tonight and afternoon uh, on your side, Piotr. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, the three speakers. Uh, uh, Binus, uh, really appreciate you uh, coming to our uh, campus virtually um, and yeah of, we i can conclude that uh, no perfect countries no perfect markets uh, however the uh, chartered financial analysts uh, are still regarded as a, a high profile um, professions so that could uh, not only uh, working in the investment bankers but also in other uh, financial industry However, to get the holders is not that easy. It's not like just you like uh, take the bachelor degree. It needs it uh, also requires your uh, maturity, mental maturity in terms of um, uh, mentally. So you can uh, have it as long as you uh, progress also in your uh, maturity because there are many things that you have to uh, learn in the CFA. So no pain, no gain. So uh, you have to work hard for your CFA holders if you want to get one. But it is, it promises you uh, uh, the job uh, and then uh, it's also come with a quite good and high uh, salary if you are uh, work for the salary. Yeah, however, it should be also um, um, considered that although you have the global um, awarded a global certification like CFA, but when you apply it to certain countries or certain markets, then you have to be with, uh, wise. Yeah, the wisdom, the local wisdom is also 
should be uh, considered and should be applied as well. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, today. And I think the last uh, sessions we will take a photo session. So if all participants can uh, uh, turn on the camera, we will have a photo sessions. So uh, if uh, someone can help me to uh, have the photo sessions here, and then we will. Uh, okay, um, then. Uh, Anyone can? Uh, okay, how many? Oh, so we have 18 pages. So it means that we have to take one by one. Okay, Difa, you can do it. Thank you very much, Difa. Uh, we have 18 pages, Difa. So uh, it means that we ha you have to take uh, 18 shots, yeah? Okay. Uh, 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 Arif, can you unmute Difa so Difa can count one, two, three, so we have a good uh, picture. No, okay, so um, uh, you can chat uh, Difa, okay. Uh, pa Arif, are you still there? Can I, can I? Unmute Diva. Let me check. Uh, Diva, yes. okay. Yes. okay, okay, okay. That's good. Um, so you can uh, count, yeah, to three, so that we can have a good pose for for okay. our picture. Okay, we have. Yeah. 10 pages now. Oh, 10 pages now? Okay. Yes. Uh, I take sc uh, the screenshot quickly, so please okay. be ready. I yeah. will come. Okay. Just smile and I, I, I will tell you when it's done. Okay, one, two, three, please prepare. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page Eight, page nine. Okay, it's done. Okay, thank you, Difa. Okay, uh, students, uh, I think you have to fill in the form, but the form uh, for the uh, SAT point and the e certificate, uh, the form will be uh, provided in the website of this uh, International Lecture Week. Again, I would like to thank uh, Piotr, Pak Rahmat, and Pak Bisma for this uh, opportunity and I wish you a best luck for your uh, career in the future. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be with you and uh, hope to hope to see you again. Thank okay. you. Good. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Okay. Good night. Good night.